Hi, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to this session on how effective altruism can impactfully engage in climate. Uh, my name is Claire. I'm the program manager at Founders Pledge, and I'm excited to be introducing a session on a topic that has a lot of attention on the world stage, but maybe not necessarily within the EA movement. So thank you for being here. Um, we're going to explore how EA has uncovered high impact but neglected solutions and organizations using the case study of the Clean Air Task Force. And we're going to work to dispel the myth that EAs do not engage in climate. Um, our speakers today are Johannes Aqua, Senior Climate Researcher at Founders Pledge, and Armand Cohen, Executive Director of the Clean Air Task Force. Johannes um, most notably leads the Climate Change Fund, a pooled philanthropic resource which is dedicated to finding and funding high-impact solutions to the climate crisis. It's been endorsed by Effective Giving Community, giving what we can as its top recommendation in climate, and the fund has donated more than 10 million to the most effective interventions and organizations to the date. Um, Johannes's work and the Climate Change Fund have appeared in many influential pu publications on many high-profile stages, including the AP, Vox, and the Volts podcast, as well as the Stanford Existential Risks Conference. Um, Armin leads the Clean Air Task Force, um, which is a global climate and energy research, advocacy, and technology catalyst organization that promotes policy and business practices that better manage climate change. And it's been recognized three years in a row by Vox as a top-tier climate charity. Armin leads deep dives on energy system modeling and evolution, practical barriers and solutions for making low-carbon systems happen in the real world, and the problems of nuclear energy as a climate management contributor and possible solutions. So Johannes and Armin are each going to give brief complimentary presentations. Um, they're going to have a conversation together, and then around halfway through, we're going to transition to audience Q&A. So please, as a reminder, if you have any questions, make sure to put them on the swap card app, and I'll join them back on stage to um, manage the Q&A. So starting us off, I'm going to turn it over to Johannes. Yeah, thank you, Claire, for the nice introduction. And I'm just going to start with the elephant. Oh, sorry. <laughs> with the elephant in the room, and it's a really big elephant, which is kind of societal. Sorry, does the clicker? Okay, the clicker doesn't seem to work. But so like the really big elephant in the room, which is kind of societal attention to climate, right? It's really, really large. It's at something like one trillion or so. Climate philanthropy is about two orders of magnitude lower than that, so like at around 10 billion or so. But still, if you, that's like a lot of money. If you compare it essentially to everything else that kind of EAs care about, this is like a very, very crowded space. So the question, and I think it's a very legitimate question, like how can EAs or should EAs actually engage in... <laughs> okay, uh, should EAs actually uh, engage in climate? Um, yeah, it's like actually like a really, really important question. And I think like for me, the answer seems very clear that there's only really a case to engage in climate from an effective altruist perspective if two things are true. One, that essentially a very large part of the societal response is actually misallocated so that, that it can actually improve a lot, and two, that you can actually improve it through additional kind of uh, philanthropy into very targeted philanthropy. And that's kind of our theory of, of change at Founders Pledge, right? And it's like you can barely see it because it's three orders of magnitude smaller than climate philanthropy at large, but that's our estimate for the climate fund this year, right? And like the theory of change is essentially trying to influence philanthropy and then kind of trying to influence societal spending um, overall. So is it actually true that there's something to be improved in our climate response? And oh, sorry, this is the other clicker. Um, so I guess the first kind of data point that you can get for this is like if you look at something like how climate philanthropy is being spent, you can kind of see, OK, it's actually, even though it's 10 billion, it's not really spent very evenly. And there's actually really big holes. So there's a lot of spending, if you look at different regions in the US and Europe, there's a lot of spending on clean electricity, mostly renewables. There's a lot of spending on natural climate solutions. Once you leave the OECD behind, you're essentially having almost no funding in anything that isn't uh, renewables or trees. So this is kind of, I think, maybe a first data point that maybe there is something that's kind of misallocated and something we can do about this or something to improve. But of course, to really like make a claim like this, you kind of need a theory of like how should impact um, actually, or what, what optimizing for impact in climate actually means, and that's what I'm going to 
talk about real brief. And essentially, what I'm going to argue is that really an optimization problem across three dimensions. So you want to optimize across time, across space, and across future. Let's start with the easy one first, optimizing across time. And here you can kind of see, okay, energy production thus far. Here's the share of low carbon energy. Here's kind of where we need to go by 2050 and then by 2100. So like massive, massive build out of clean energy. And I think there's two things that are pretty clear about this. First, it's massive and it has to go fast. But there's also a more subtle implication, which is like if you kind of think about how to optimize, it doesn't really matter what happens like this year or next year. It kind of what really matters is that you want to change the trajectory, right? So you want to optimize for cumulative impact. And this is actually quite different from optimizing for short-term impact, as we will see. The second dimension to kind of optimize across is space. And this is, um, yeah, kind of looking at emission shares of different economies or different blocks going forward. It's kind of what I sometimes call like the central conundrum of the climate challenge. So all of us here kind of coming from high income countries or most of us, we're kind of very responsible historically for climate change, but we don't really like focusing on our, our own emissions. We don't really have a lot of leverage kind of on, on the future of climate change because like the EU is something like 3%, the US maybe something like 6% of future emissions. So optimizing for kind of climate impact across locations means optimizing for solutions kind of where most future emissions are. There's also a flip side to this, which is like when you're engaging in a high income country like, or high income region like the EU or the US, you probably want to focus on kind of improving, optimizing on indirect effects. So for example, if you think about innovation capacity, you can kind of see it's essentially uh, inversely correlated to future emissions. So when you're kind of in the US and the EU, you probably want to evaluate policy by what does it do to, to accelerate clean tech innovation as, a, as an ability to kind of have a large global impact. So those two dimensions are pretty straightforward, but this is just an example to kind of show why they're really important. So let's say you're in Germany in the early 2000s, you want to reduce emissions. What do you do? Well, you think, okay, we have a lot of coal, let's buy some Russian gas. That is like a very cost-effective way to reduce emissions in the short term in Germany in the early 2000s. It's actually not what Germany did. Germany spent hundreds of billions um, over the decade to kind of subsidize renewables. And I can tell you from painful experience, it's not a very sunny place. So it didn't really have large effects in Germany, but it really had transformative effects, not only Germany, of course, but still like transformative effect on the cost of renewables on solar in particular, and kind of leading, kind of changing the trajectory forever. So this kind of really carries home. There's usually a negative correlation between like um, what you can see in the short term and what's kind of important in the, in the long term. Okay. Yeah, the third dimension is a lot more subtle, um, but I think kind of uh, EAs kind of know it as mission, mission hedging which is the idea if you look at expected um, damage, so kind of a combination of how likely are different futures and how damaging they are, you will find that like most damage is probably like concentrated in worlds which are pretty bad, like above 3.5 degrees or so. And this is really important. We know something that is very likely or we know things about those worlds that are likely to be true in those worlds, right? So like we're not in the four degree world, for example, and like we have like renewables have succeeded uh, completely or we're not in a four degree world and like international climate policy is in the good place. So this really means like when we kind of think about solutions where like most of the damage is concentrated, we can kind of find robust and, and kind of hedgy solutions. So that's kind of the third um, dimension to optimize across, which kind of gives us then the three dimensional optimization challenge across time, across space, and across futures. And maybe not surprisingly, yeah, uh, I tend to think that our current response, the mainstream response to climate is actually not very optimized across the solution. So if we kind of look at this again, we can kind of say like a lot of the focus like is on very mature technologies at this point, the mature renewables. Then there's a lot of kind of natural solutions. There's a lot of solutions that are very poorly funded. And I think Armin will kind of go into this more. But like what I would essentially say, like our current response kind of as a society overall is like really like a biased best case bet. So like it's mostly focused on mature, relatively mature technologies. It's mostly focused on the small set of technologies. And the reason for that is not like an optimization for impact, but the reason for that is essentially popularity with green constituencies on the one hand, and then kind of why is there so much funding focused on the US and Europe? It's, it's like because there's home bias, because like there's a lot of philanthropy kind of where you're at. So like, and then of course, if you're thinking about what I talked about last, the third dimension, 
if you're kind of in the world where like there's a lot of climate damage, like we know that like part of the mainstream bet, et cetera, must have failed. Yeah, and like the Founders Pledge approach to climate or essentially how we think about this really exists in direct response to this. So the goal is kind of to say, let's like let's make bets that kind of de-risk against the worst outcome. Yeah, so I don't have time to go about this because um, we have very little time, but I'm just gonna talk to but one example. And um, so it was just kind of really about if you're a small funder, how can you actually have a large impact on the climate space? And the example here is about catalytically growing organizations that will then have a large impact. And I'm gonna focus obviously here, given the example on the Clean Air Task Force. This is where you can kind of see like the budget of the Clean Air Task Force, which has been like roughly stable for a decade or so until like Founders Pledge in 2018, decided to recommend it. And then you kind of got a trajectory changing dynamic, which looks a little bit like an intelligence explosion that we are familiar with, right? So something really radically changed. And of course, like, Correlation isn't causation, right? So you should always kind of say like, okay, what are kind of other things? What are the counterfactuals? So we actually did a lot of analysis of like different counterfactuals, like what else changed? We looked at like, what if like CATF had grown like an average climate organization? What if it had grown like the best year ever it had before in terms of growth or like many other comparisons? So it's very clear something changed around that time as well, right? So like you shouldn't say like, this is all the impact of founders pledge and the A community. But you can also very clearly see that there's kind of a much more steeper kind of development. So like, it seems reasonable to say that like the EA community had a really large kind of impact. And I guess Armin will, will talk about this kind of more qualitatively, but also like just quantitatively you can see that effect. And this really uh, kind of, yeah, combines to like two lessons that I really want to emphasize. So like one is like, if you're in climate, because it's such a crowded space, like the path to high impact really cannot, like really has to go for improving uh, kind of the mainstream response. So kind of conceiving of the lack of neglectedness, conceiving of the crowdedness as an opportunity to leverage resources. And I mean, the example that I've just showed you kind of shows that this is actually something uh, that can work. So right, relatively marginal interventions in terms of what the EA community has been doing by kind of like growing advocates can have really large impacts uh, kind of on organizations. But of course, growing organizations is not the goal in itself, right? The, the goal is that these organizations positively transform our climate response. And that's why I'm so excited that Armin kind of do the second part of his presentation and kind of make this more concrete and show how the kind of the Clean Air Task Force and the, like the rise of the Clean Air Task Force really has kind of uh, made a significant difference on climate progress. Um, thanks, uh, and Johannes, it, 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 the um, the math, the math. I can get behind the math there. It it, it certainly is not uh, it's not um, accidental, and we can go into that as to, as to how uh, effective altruism interventions um, moved us forward. Um, so I'm going to talk about the gaps, and uh, let's see, uh, is this the one, the green one, or okay, this should be the one. Okay, um, I'm just going to talk about the gaps that. Uh, that, that uh, Johannes identified and how effective altruism, and in particular the Founders Pledge, um, has helped us address them. So this is the wor this is the trajectory we're supposed to be on. This is the CO2 curve we're supposed to be on. Just about now, we're supposed to be on a steep decline, right? Um, and going down by mid-century, and that green area is when we're gonna start sucking carbon out of the atmosphere. In fact, this is what we're doing, so something's missing here. We're not, we're not going to, according to plan. Um, now, while we celebrate uh, wind and solar having come on stream, now representing about 5% of global energy, you can see that over the last uh, couple decades, we've actually uh, piled on fossil fuels even faster than we've done renewables. So renewables are good. We do a lot to support them. But are they a complete solution? They're the wedge at the top. Um, we're, in a, we're in a race here, and fossil fuels are still winning. Um, so the mainstream response of philanthropy and NGOs has really three parts. Um, first of all, we're gonna flatten it and, or decrease energy demand. Number two, we're gonna electrify everything. And then third, we're gonna power the grid, mostly with wind and solar. The studies that you see are you know, 90 to 100%. Um, and this is a pretty typical study where uh, we see the co composition in 2050 of, of, uh, the, of the global energy system, the green representing solar, the blue representing wind, and everything else kind of tiny. 
Um, sometimes you see it reverse. Sometimes you'll see a study with 70% wind and 20% solar. But this, this is kind of the, the mainstream story out there in policy circles and in the NGO community and in philanthropy. Now, um, CATF is completely down with renewables. I spent a lot of my life trying to get solar and wind sited around the world. This is a report that we recently did in California to sort of show the state how far it was behind and how, how uh, aggressively it needed to intervene to move things forward. But uh, there are reasons we might want to diversify our strategy, and that's kind of where effective altruism has been most helpful with us. Um, so the first part of that story is uh, flattened demand. Um, the, the first part of our contrarian questioning uh, is that uh, uh, the, um, we assume that the world is going to consume much less energy in the future. Efficiency is going to gain overall. But um, in fact, the models that suggest that, and this is a pretty typical ensemble of models from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, have a very ugly fact associated with them, which is that Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia are assumed to continue to, be, to live in energy poverty, to have uh, only a fraction of the energy per capita that we in the rich world do, or even in the middle income countries. So this is one way the, the books get balanced, is we assume that basically the developing world doesn't grow in terms of its energy demand, which I think is a kind of a scandalous assumption, but it's completely ubiquitous in the literature. Second, can we electrify everything? Well, maybe we can electrify a lot, but there's heavy freight, um, there's marine shipping, there's steel, there's um, glass, there's cement, which by the way, the things on the right are represent about 20% of global CO2 emissions. So maybe um, there are some solutions perhaps to electrify and run everything. Um, and get rid of fuels, we think there actually needs to be some hedging there in case all that doesn't work out. We can go into that in Q&A. And then finally, there's the problem of running an, an entire global power grid on weather-dependent energy. Again, I love renewables. Solar and wind are getting cheaper all the time. But we do have this problem of seasonal variability. This graph um, is, is, um, shows wind and solar output, solar in yellow, uh, wind in purple, and, and energy demand integrated across the year. Um, this is a 40-year mean um, for the US. And uh, as you can see, it's not just a matter of daily management. If it was just a daily problem, we could manage with batteries, probably. It would be expensive, but we could still manage it. What you have is a seasonal variation of you know two to one in terms of output over. So you have that those kind of seasonal gaps to fill. You also see in that kind of fuzzy purple area interannual vari variability. So we don't have to just deal with, we don't, we're not just concerned with um, seasonal problems, but also wild swings from year to year. Um, and in fact, what we're seeing now in the climate modeling is that uh, wind power may be actually on a decline in the northern hemisphere. Um, this actually shows uh, in the red uh, parts of Europe where uh, wind speed has declined um, substantially since, uh, since, the, um, since the late 70s. And this is, the climate models would suggest that this has to do with differential, uh, the, 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 the squeezing of high and low temperatures due to general global warming. Um, there's also the land use intensity of various energy forms. Again, a lot of kit is going to be required. Um, and if we go extremely heavily only on wind and solar, again, they have their value. They're, they're tremendous resources. But this uh, visual will show you if we went to a system that was dominated by wind and solar, we would have the kind of um, uh, land use requirements that are exemplified in, in the blacks, in the, uh, in the uh, hard squares. Um, that, those are 100% wind and solar uh, and, and other renewables. The dotted boxes are 70% wind and solar with, with other resources sown in. So either way, we've got a huge challenge. But um, we also have to be mindful of the fact that uh, that uh, we can't scale necessarily exponentially forever. Um, and this is an example of some data from Spain and Germany which show pretty typical pattern. We've also seen this in California and in Iowa and other places where you get this initial burst of wind and solar development as you've got good sites and you've got support. As you begin to saturate the landscape, um, you, the best sites are taken up um, and you begin to get opposition and permitting issues. Um, again, not an unsolvable problem completely, but I think it's 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 reason for caution. Um, just um, this is my version of of Johannes' slide about um, probabilities. Um, you know, this is just kind of a probability tree. Let's. I've, I've mentioned the problem of electrifying everything. I've mentioned the problem of um, of integrating uh, energy across uh, uh, variable energy across the year. Um, I've talked about. Um, you know, uh, scaling and so forth. And we can talk about all of those issues, uh, demand. But if you think there's a 90% chance you're going to succeed, let's say, at five 
of those uh, decision points, you end up with a 40% chance of failure because the, the, the uncertainties just multiply. So again, simple math. I mean, I'm not saying these numbers are real, but um, the point is that if you ha even if you had high confidence that each of those separate uh, hurdles could be tackled, you, you would still have a high probability of failure. Um, the th kinds of things that we work on um, to kind of fill the gaps or to uh, you know, kind of diversify the supply are, are shown here. I won't go in in detail. We can do that in Q&A. Um, there is a way to carbon, capture carbon from heavy industry. The upper left is a steel mill in Abu Dhabi um, that um, uh, captures all of its carbon. Um, lower left is carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere. That's a Climeworks plant in Iceland that's doing that today. Gas with carbon capture, a small modular nuclear, um, and hydrogen from various zero carbon sources. These are all things that are not normally in the environmental toolkit or the philanthropic toolkit, hence the, the role of effective altruism. One particular technology that we worked on that was really couldn't have worked on until Founders Pledge and others got excited about it is deep, super hot rock geothermal. On the left is conventional geothermal where you can only drill into existing shallow geothermal pools. But what if you could actually drill deep into super hot dry rock, inject water, get steam up, um, you could uh, basically do geothermal anywhere in the world and knock out a coal boiler and replace it with uh, supercritical steam. So this is very interesting technology. No one was interested in it. We didn't have any money to work on it. Um, but but um, Founders Pledge among and some others began to look at this and say, hey, that's kind of interesting. Um, in terms of diversification, this is, a, this is a, a picture of total investment by year in the global energy transition by the private sector and public sector. And you can see yellow and green are solar or renewable energy and electrified transport, respectively. Obviously, that's the dominant share. You can barely see the carbon capture and storage and nuclear wedge. There are two problems with this. First of all, as I've tried to argue, this doesn't necessarily do the job that we need to do in, in total. Uh, kind of just as bad, it makes us think we're doing the job. Um, there's a lot of self-congratulation now uh, in the in philanthropic community, in, the, in my uh, community, about how well we're doing on wind and solar, which is, again, you know, fantastic. We work on it. But, but if, we, if we get too self-congratulatory and too complacent and don't question our own um, positions, um, this can be a problem. My thesis is that, as you saw from that, that curve, and we're not the only beneficiaries of effective altruism in, in, intervention, um, effective altruism and other philanthropy that, that I think EA has influenced has helped address that gap. Just I'm going to conclude with an example from the US going back. Um, this network of groups was funded by uh, Founders Pledge and some of uh, fellow travelers um, to put together a pragmatic center pro-diversification pro cadre in the US to push um, three bills over the last two years in the US the Energy Act of 2020, the Infrastructure Bill, and the Inflation Reduction Act of 2022. In total, $800 billion to $1 trillion for clean energy. It's the largest expenditure for zero carbon energy ever by any government on the planet. Um, and interestingly, it's a highly diverse bill. Um, depending on how you count and how many projects get, get built, between 40 and $200 billion of that is for the, all the technologies that people usually don't talk about. Um, carbon capture, nuclear, and hydrogen. Um, this bill in its form would not have existed, I think, without that network and in turn without the philanthropy that was willing to break with the herd and, and ask some, some deep questions. Um, there's, a, there's a political dimension to this as well as kind of an intellectual dimension. Um, Joe Manchin, as everyone knows, was the key vote in the, um, in the, in the uh, uh, Inflation Reduction Act, and it was the ability to bring alternative ideas to the table that ultimately swung him over to vote in favor of the bill. So I'm going to stop there, and uh, I think um, from here we're going to kind of have a little bit of dialogue and then open it to the, uh, to the group. So thank you very much for your attention. Am I still, am I still plugged? Okay, cool. Armin, thanks so much for that. So I'm going to ask you the first question. And this is essentially so just, just about the last example. So if you're kind of, I'm going to try to like take a cynical, cynical take on this. So if you're kind of saying, okay, uh, the Democrats just control Congress, Senator Manchin kind of from a cold state of West Virginia is like the marginal senator. If you kind of look at the Inflation Reduction Act and the other bills that are kind of have a lot of focus on like CCS and also kind of other things that are closer in the political center, like nuclear, et cetera. 
what would you say kind of to the to this kind of claim okay the fact that this build look the way they do is just a reflection of kind of the fact that that Seneca Mansion was kind of the decisive vote. Well, there, there's that for sure. And, but there's also the fact that the whole debate has shifted. And again, there's been, um, this has been, I think, an, an important part of effect, um, effective altruism's influence. And again, again, we'll talk about this later, some of the philanthropies that EA has influenced, because I think thought leadership by EA has made a difference. Um, the Democratic Party was centered pretty much on a narrative that wind solar batteries are it. Um, this was true for, for many, many years. Um, beginning, uh, we, we were kind of lone voices on that, but those voices got amplified. And so it wasn't just about Senator Manchin, it was also about the rest of the party. Um, even, you know, Ocasio-Cortez, you know, said, well, you know, maybe nuclear, I don't know, maybe that belongs in the mix. Um, you know, let's see, uh, let's give it a shot. You know, let's see if it can do its thing. And that that's a very profound shift in the landscape. Um, and then on the other hand, so that's on the, that's on the center and left, and then on the right, um, if you want to call it that, uh, uh, you know, Manchin's got in West Virginia, a coal state, uh, Trump beat um, Biden by 30, 30 points in that state. But it, so part of it was, um, you know, he's not going to naturally gravitate to climate issues, but he was reachable on, on, on the grounds that, A, um, actually there is a way to think about maybe continuing to use natural gas with, with zero carbon. There is a way to think about diversifying. And um, the other thing I would say is that the climate movement's approach to Manchin was to demonize him, to, to bust people into Charleston and say, you know, you're a bad guy because you're not voting for climate. He's like, well, what the hell? Uh, you know, if, if I vote for climate change, they're like, I'm just going to get defeated because they're going to say I caved to the left. So like wrong approach. But that's where philanthropy was putting its chips down. We took a very different approach, which was to actually work with him, uh, run ads in his um, in our C4. We ran ads supporting what he did um, and when he did it um, and also had a good relationship with his staff. He started out as a skeptic on carbon capture and storage because there had been one very large failure in the state. But we came back to him and, and actually were able to work with his staff and show him successful examples of carbon capture. So it's both an intellectual um, kind of shift, um, kind of a, a political shift. And um, again, we'll, you can do a case study, but I think it would show that, that the, the role of independent green groups as opposed to green groups that felt like they were married to the traditional narrative did make a big difference. So Johannes, I wanted to ask you, um, the, obviously we're on a rocket ride since you, uh, since you uh, found us uh, many years ago um, uh, in terms of our effectiveness and our, our size and scale. But what, um, what's your methodology? I mean, I was always like, how did you find us? You know, how, how did you screen? And then, you know, I'm particularly interested in what's the role of quantification because the report that you put up on the website that led to all this viral funding for us said that we were a pretty cheap date for climate. We were like 50 cents to a dollar a ton. So how does that work? Like, what did you guys, how do you guys approach this? Yeah, so I think like the, the principle methodology, right, with like classical and like I'm talking here about the, the report that my predecessor, John John Halsett, was doing. So it was kind of like classical EA methodology, like looking for importance, tractability, sorry, importance, tractability, neglectedness of different interventions, which if you do this in the climate space, or especially if when, when he was doing it in 2017, 2018, kind of leads you to stuff like advanced nuclear or um, carbon capture and storage and like kind of looking for, for advocates there and then kind of combining that with like analysis and a really deep analysis with kind of case studies. I think that the role of quantification is actually like something that, I mean, we also kind of changed our posture on this because the, the number, like, I think there's like a 30 page case study. There are a couple of numbers, and like everyone kind of cites those cost effectiveness numbers where while these cost effectiveness numbers are really like a relatively small part, the recommendation are really more of a plausibility check. And we've kind of moved to think about quantification mostly in terms of comparison. So right, this, right now, because if you're kind of in a high uncertainty context and you're kind of doing a quantitative analysis, you can always kind of come out with like very different estimates and what we're kind of focusing on now is kind of trying to rather get than getting the absolute cost effectiveness right, getting the relative cost effectiveness right because that ultimately matters. So kind of trying to under, understand the space and what drives the differential effectiveness. Cool. That, that being said, I think it's very believable that effective climate charities are below $1. I think the skepticism for this mostly comes from the fact that Offsets are perceived like offsets are cheap and offsets are a fraud. But the reason that offsets are a fraud is because you can't like 
do direct interventions for less than one dollar. But like if you're kind of thinking about leveraging advocacy and leveraging technological change and like kind of focusing on neglected areas, it seems like very plausible to me that like many many charities actually should, should meet that goal of less than one dollar. And I think my, my true estimate would probably be significantly lower than that. Great. Do you have any other questions for me? I do. Um, yeah, so I've kind of showed this like graph kind of how, uh, how kind of CTF essentially took off. And I guess I wanted to, to hear from you, like how was this kind of like, what was kind of the role, like how did this kind of work uh, on, the, on the inside? Like what, what was kind of the, the role of the report and what can we learn about this kind of yeah. going forward? Yeah, as I said earlier, that was not, there's no way that was an accident. <laughs> no way that, that was just pure random um, effect. Um, what happened when Founders Pledge um, noticed our work uh, was immediately there were uh, uh, family offices, um, high net worth individuals who wouldn't necessarily consider themselves part of the EA movement formally, but they, they tended to think the same way. Um, that is looking for high impact for the dollar, kind of, they tend to be people who've got a technical or financial backgrounds we found. I've talked to a lot of these people personally. And the um, kind of the, the halo effect, if you will, um, of saying, of having someone go deep, I think it was like a 30 page report. Um, and, you know, really, <laughs> I, I joke with Johannes that I think it took us a thousand staff hours to answer the questions that, that EA, um, that uh, Founders Pledge put to us. But it, it actually was really interesting because it forced us to think a lot more clearly about our own strategy and to um, justify it to, our, to ourselves um, as well as to FP. And so uh, that, was, that was helpful, number one. Number two, um, once it was up, um, it just had enormous leverage um, through the system. And again, it's, it's almost like a, you know, it's a, uh, maybe it's a long tail, but, uh, but it was a tail uh, that didn't exist before. And um, so again, for us, you know, we're a $55 million organization today. We were started out as a $7 million organization before Founders Pledge found us. I don't think we want to grow a whole lot more. We like to stay lean. But the, um, or at least we're not going to grow until we can get our feet under us with this growth. But uh, the, um, but you know, other organizations, um, I won't name them, but you know, they're more like in the, you know, 300, 400, 500 million dollar a year range. And so this leverage effect is very significant. If you can get a few actors moving, um, disrupt the narrative, um, get people thinking a different way, philanthropy changes, and also it becomes safer, frankly for groups like mine to get out there a little farther because um, we're not kind of on a short leash from foundations that are, you know, asking you to take the party line. So just huge, huge impact, both in terms of, of just the obvious growth, but also kind of changing the, the, the environment. Um, and uh, so I want to, so in that vein, um, I think the last question before we go to the audience, um, uh, Johannes, uh, what, how do you think about the role of uh, FP, because that's really all you can speak of, um, in terms of moving the, moving the ecosystem or moving the thought space. Um, obviously, the money helps a lot, but what do you do? How do you think about your role in that, in sort of shifting the landscape of discussion? Yeah, so I think we were also surprised by the effect, right, that this, this report had, but I think kind of looking at this over time, I think it has become more and more part of our like explicit strategy, essentially to be like thought leaders, to publish our work, go on podcasts, et cetera, and kind of essentially use this analysis to kind of motivate um, other actors because like EA, like if you kind of look at these charts, like most of this funding is not from EA donors directly, right? Like maybe like a tenth or I, I'm not sure, but I would estimate something like that and right, and EAs in general will not kind of spend hundreds of millions on climate given, given where we kind of see like the most neglected areas, but kind of trying to, yeah, enrich this conversation essentially by kind of focusing on effectiveness and making sure that the, the vast attention or the vast kind of climate attention that is already there is kind of directed to more more effective ways is absolutely part of the explicit strategy at this point. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been I've been impressed by actually how much impact podcasts can have on philanthropy. I mean, it's, you know, Johannes has been on a few and um, you know, a lot of people come to us and they say yeah, I heard this great podcast by this guy, Johannes, you know, and uh, Founders Pledge likes you, like, you know, and that, that's, that's, that's been the story. And as you say, Johannes, some of these people wouldn't be, think of themselves as in the, in the traditional EA thing, but, but they think that way, you know, ITN is very much on their, it's more intuitive to them. Um, and um, so I, I, it's been just an interesting experience, but um, uh, I do think that the, the field has shifted. So I think, Claire, we're going to sort of move to the audience now. Yeah, 
let's do that. Um, I'm just going to plug the swap card app again. If you guys want to upvote anything or plug in anything, I'm happy to prioritize based off of that. Um, so we'll start with one that I think is hopefully an easy answer, which is just, is CTAF an organization that companies can donate to to offset their carbon emissions and become science-based targets initiative certified? Yeah, so there, there are two problems with that. One is, um, <laughs> we uh, first of all, we just don't accept uh, corporate donations. Um, we, uh, uh, we, yeah, just, we have enough problem with our left flanks uh, that if we were to take, you know, I, I'm being a little bit uh, facetious, but no, we like to remain completely independent of private sector um, donations because um, of perception, obviously, but also, frankly, you know, I think once you start doing that, you can justify all kinds of things to yourself. So no, we don't take money. Um, people do come to us and ask about what are, are um, interesting offsets or useful offsets. Again, we refuse to recommend any commercial product. What we are doing right now, though, is working on a, um, a conversation, a platform, uh, some kind of um, <laughs> system that could rate the efficacy of offsets. So for example, in the natural solution space, which is planting trees and modifying soils and things like that, um, we're really trying to gather the global scientific community around what would be a good offset. So we're, we're kind of operate at that higher level. So yeah, we, we don't, um, we don't, uh, we don't do kind of that that sort of service thing. Okay, thanks, Johannes. I know you have thoughts and feelings about offsets. Do you want to say anything? Um, no. No. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, next question then. Um, can you speak to maybe this is for Johannes um, neglectness within the climate funding space itself? I know that on one of your first slides you sort of have that um, graph of where money's going. So. So what is still neglected? Is that the question? Neglectedness within this climate funding space itself. So maybe as people are thinking about like innovative new tech versus like sort of these tried and true natural climate solutions, where should we be thinking about directing new money? Yeah. So I mean, obviously, yeah, this is like changing very quickly, but um, so that's why we're kind of doing analysis on this, like trying to update our analysis on this every year. But I think right now, um, like one thing that has really changed is like Bezos Earth Fund have come onto the scene and that's really kind of turbocharged climate philanthropy and institutional climate philanthropy. Like Bezos has essentially doubled climate philanthropy, but like for the most part, I think it's kind of focused on the classical area. So like lots of funding on natural solutions, lots of funding on, on renewables and lots of funding on environmental justice. Um, carbon removal has also boomed, so we've been investing in carbon removal before, we probably wouldn't do that right now. So I think the most neglected areas right now, as I would see them, is just probably stuff around, like, I guess on the one hand, like industrial decarbonization, uh, et cetera, so like, kind of, yeah, like a lot of the, the holes that you kind of saw in that graph. I think another area um, that, that is also shifting, but still kind of seems quite neglected to me, is like um, emerging economies, and like carbon lock in emerging economies because it's still, like for example, China, like China is like, well, obviously like the largest emitter of this country and also like the largest um, provider of clean energy and like receives 6% of global climate philanthropy, which like seems crazy, crazy low to me. Um, this is sort of related to that one. So um, how much work is being done to convince the trillion dollars in other spending to be more effective? Yeah, so I think um, that, the, well, the first, uh, the first thing I would say is that um, investment follows policy in this space, okay? So um, Johannes's example of why did solar get so cheap and why, does, why is it now basically financeable by the private sector? Uh, at the scale that it is, it has to do with reducing risk. So the way you, you, you kind of um, you know, activate or, or make sure that the money you have is spent well is you is you you get very strategic about what you need to de-risk. We spent a decade and a half de-risking solar. We spent two decades de-risking wind. They're now viable uh, tech, uh, tech, uh, energy sources, at least from energy. We put aside capacity and reliability that I talked about, but they're tremendous assets for us. But that was deliberate policy that drove down the costs. I, I think we need to do the same thing with carbon capture, with hydrogen, with industrial decarbonization technology. Um, with um, with nuclear, advanced nuclear, you know, fusion actually seems to have quite a bit of funding from the private sector right now. Um, so I'm not sure that that's necessarily an imperative for public funding. But the way uh, we think about it, if you look at this, you know, these bills, they were designed to do the 
um, early lifting to get the kind of to get the technologies to the scale where they can then begin to kind of probably never quite compete with fossil fuels head to head, but get within spitting distance. So the, it's, it, you have to be very strategic about this. And you know, some have argued, well, we're spending too much on solar because it's already economic. In truth, because of the reliability issues, it's it's it still does need the policy support. So it's it's a delicate it's an art. You know, you got to figure out if you got a trillion dollars to spend, you want to probably weight part of the portfolio to the things that aren't quite commercial yet, because you you know to Johannes's point, what you want is leverage. Um, you know, it's going to be a, a number of decades here. Those curves don't look really promising. You want stuff that's going to take off um, exponentially and and start going of its own weight um, economically. So that's a high level answer and we could drill down into details, but it's, it's just about being strategic. Yeah. Yeah, I think one, one thing I would add there from the philanthropy perspective is like, I think kind of making sure, like this is the key role of philanthropy, right? Changing the conversation. So that's why I had the like philanthropy kind of box below kind of the societal response because philanthropy can play a real kind of significant role in changing the conversation and especially kind of moving it away from the biases that the response has on default, right? Like by default, the response will be focused on existing technology, on local technology, because like those, those things have like interest groups on popular technology. So like if you're kind of an impact maximizing uh, philanthropist, like kind of seems a pretty safe bet, kind of, kind of focusing on the stuff that's unpopular, that's like kind of needs more time, et cetera, it's like gonna be a much, much better uh, bet. You have to be careful of too much success, too, because if you build a political economy around a particular energy source, you may find that um, it, 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 it creates a rent-seeking situation. Um, the nuclear industry is a perfect example in its heyday. Um, fundamentally, you know, I mean, France went nuclear. Um, you know, a lot of European countries went very heavily nuclear. Um, U.S. started down that road but got very fat and lazy in terms of, of its cost discipline and so forth. There was plenty of policy behind it, too much policy, I would argue. It was, it was too sheltered from competition um, as a result of which we now have very expensive nuclear plants around the world and no one really wants to build any. Um, whereas, you know, there's a different model that we could uh, adopt and Japan in its heyday did this, um, uh, South Korea, uh, the UAE has shown this. If you have cost discipline and you, you really decide you're not going to just feather bed the industry, um, you can actually get pretty low cost nuclear plants that operate just fine. Thank you. Um, this question I'm sure you could write a thesis on, but it is, can you speak to the role of the developing world in adopting new clean energy systems as they advance economically? Yeah, so you wanna, yeah. so um, I think this is, the, as I showed you know, earlier, you know, um, the average African consumes 1 20th per capita, the, the, um, uh, the energy that we do, it, even in middle income countries. Um, so this is, this is a huge issue. Um, I think the the reality is that um, whatever we whatever the developing world does is going to have to be affordable. It's not going to do what Germany did, right? And and you know pay twenty cents a kilowatt hour for you know solar or forty cents or whatever it was at the beginning. Um, so I think we have to sort of see the developing world as being somewhat on the receiving end of the the rich world's early investment in things like this. Um, and that's actually a deliberate strategy on our part is to use the 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 political momentum for clean technology in the West um, to pour tons of money basically into commercializing these technologies and then have uptake on the other end. Um, I think the other part of that though is making these countries or allowing these countries the space to develop in the way that they want to develop. And there is a narrative which is I think not helpful. Um, you see it in uh, a lot of the um, IPCC uh, uh, and, and, and in the other uh, visions for, for Africa, for example, um, that, you know, that the answer to Africa's problem is, is village solar electrification. It's iconic. You know, you have the kid who's finally able to, you know, has a light bulb and could read at night. And that's, that's really, really good. But the reality of Africa, like in 2050, Nigeria may be one of the most populous countries in, in, in the world. Um, Lagos is like more of a, of a, uh, an example than a, than a rural village. And so how do you power these mega cities? Um, and that's, that's a question of technology. How do, you, how do you do that without blowing out the climate? And that's a question partly of technology diffusion, but it's also thinking realistically about uh, scaling and providing infrastructure um, so that they really can, can do this. Building out grids is a perfect example. It's something the World Bank won't fund. 
you know, they think village electrification is where it's at. And, um, you know, why should we, why should we, you hear this narrative, why should we fund a big centralized grid for Africa when we've got all this? So there, there's a couple things. One is giving these countries the freedom to figure out what they want to do and not sitting on them um, to adopt what you think they should do. And the second is just to drive down the cost of technology. That's how I think it's going to play out, but it's going to be dynamic and it'll take a while. Thank you. I think one thing I would add to this is that I think it's kind of useful that in the European Union, for example, like you have kind of Poland or like kind of generally like Central Eastern Europe is often kind of the blocking power. And like I think in the US, similarly, that you had like a 50 50 Senate and not a 60 40 Senate in the sense that it kind of imposes uh, choices that are kind of more attuned to like like not having a super high willingness to pay, kind of like optimizing for like um, in a way like for, for a situation that kind of will work if like not every country is willing to like do, do a lot of kind of extra extra payment for the transition. Okay, changing gear slightly, but I'm gonna read two questions that are a bit related. One is, um, where does biodiversity of ecosystems fit into the climate picture? Are there efforts to address it or are they largely ignored? And then on top of that, maybe if you could also speak to somebody's wondering, are there significant known risks in the alternative interventions, especially ecologically sensitive zones in terms of long-term impacts on that bio bio <laughs> biodiversity, pollution, et cetera, which could destabilize them is the risk assessment under the radar. Yeah, let me, let me, let me give a, there, 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 there are trade-offs everywhere, um, actually. And um, so I'm just gonna speak to one reason that we have tended to focus on some of the technologies we have um, is that um, I showed you the large land footprint of an extremely high wind and solar system. That, there many studies have been done on this and we've done GIS, you know, visualization to build out a system that's, that's that dependent on weather dependent, very low power density um, sources, that is a lot of space for the kilowatt hour. You're talking about a lot of land, you're probably talking about a lot of potential habitat fragmentation. Um, and um, it's just unavoidable. You need a lot of transmission lines, uh, you need a lot of space. Um, and uh, so actually, when I, one of the reasons I think nuclear if we can make it work at scale, and, and, and again, I, I've, I've been candid about the, the, the issues, the commercial issues there, um, is that you know we're talking about a couple, three orders of magnitude in terms of power per unit of land. Um, so from a biodiversity standpoint and from a nature preservation standpoint, it, it does make a lot of sense to go to much denser power, power sources. Um, Bioenergy, um, that is burning trees basically, um, is sort of seen as a, at least the conventional bioenergy, is not so great for biodiversity. Um, we know that conventional biofuels have had a very significant negative impact on, on, uh, on forest resources around the world. So it's, it really, you have to go case by case. Um, it's not obvious though, like there, there are upsides and downsides to, to, to everything. I, we just have gen in general been attracted by things that or like deep, 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 deep hot rock geothermal, which have no impact on the environment, except you know down in the hot rock zone, which you know where nothing lives. So I mean, you know, I think that um, there are some there are some solutions in uh, here that might have less biodiversity impact. But look, anytime you drill a hole anywhere, or put kit anywhere, uh, or run a transmission line, it's going to have an impact. Thank you, um, Johannes. You mentioned that. Investing in innovation is one of the most impactful things you can do. Um, can you just speak a bit more to that? Yeah, so I mean, I think I've kind of shown this graph with kind of like the solar uh, development and like, I guess like when I look at the climate space and kind of look at the fact that like every country is like small compared to global emissions and like gonna look for mechanisms that can have like a huge transformative impact and like think te technological change or inducing innovation that's essentially I think the clearest example of, of that, right? So like we can kind of see that relatively small investments by like a couple of key jurisdictions, like three or four countries, like had a much more profound impact on the global emission trajectory than like decades of international negotiations and other kind of developments. So in that sense, that's kind of, I think that the main reason to, to kind of focus on that, that there's so that essentially that you're having this possibility to trigger a like self amplifying positive dynamic just by influencing like a couple of couple of, of key countries, which we've like seen again and again. I think that's like the one thing 
and climate that has really worked, right? Has worked with wind, has worked with solar, has worked with electric cars, et cetera. So, so yeah, I think that's what I would say. It's like a very effective and a very tractable uh, strategy that doesn't require large amounts of international co cooperation, et cetera. It doesn't require like lots of kind of um, things to be true. The, um, it, it's important, I think, also there's a nuance here. When people hear innovation, they think, oh, R&D. It's not only R&D. It's, it's also uh, early scaling demonstration, getting to that nth of a kind where you, you're kind of up a very steep cost curve, obviously, because you know, first few units of anything are going are gonna to have all the, all the costs loaded into them. Then you get, you get down the learning curve. Yeah. So getting that, that sweet spot where you're, where you're going down the learning curve um, is that's innovation too. It's learning how to how to build stuff, you know, smarter. It's not just about you know science going from the lab. Yeah, I mean the, the science funding tends to be more bipartisan, so it's actually more the kind of the stuff like the demonstration or like yeah, the, the later stage stuff that that often seems more neglected. Yeah, I think it's weird. But I, I would notice that uh, so after opposing the, the the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act, Kevin McCarthy um, is thrilled that there's going to be a hydrogen hub in his district. Uh, yeah. So you know you can you can kind of turn the politics around a little bit on this yeah. once people see the the benefits uh, circulating and, and but again scaling is an important part of the part of the picture. Fair point. Um, this person says interventions that target CO two could take multiple decades to reduce climate damages. What is the role of effective climate philanthropy in addressing faster acting interventions? So this is a kind of a hobby horse of mine because. Um, this we're going to have to operate. My view is you have to operate at multiple time scales. Um, that uh, it, just because something isn't commercially available in, in 2030 doesn't mean it's not relevant. This is going to be a century-long problem, um, and I think these models that say we're going to be out of this problem by 2050, or you know, whether we're going to solve 80 percent of it by 2030, are just not credible. So the way I would say is deploy everything you've got today. Go gangbusters on wind and solar as fast as you can. Let's get the battery technology, you know, up the speed, um, and then um, these interventions. I mean, nuclear, I think, is not on track until probably the well into the 2030s, but we have to start yesterday. Um, you know, carbon capture is in its infancy. C carbon dioxide removal is also in its infancy. But these are things where, you know, we you might not need them in the 2040s, but you might. Um, and so, uh, creating options now. So let's think about it as doing what you can today with what you have and then creating lots of options as you go forward. We can walk and chew gum. <laughs> okay, um, next question. Within the EA movement, climate is often written off as an irrelevant issue or that is at least the common perception. Can you speak to the potential issues of this dynamic, might, or how this, the potential issues this dynamic may present and how we might go about fostering a less dismissive atmosphere around the topic? potential positive impacts there might be from including more climate-related projects and people within the EA ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, I think this whole session was essentially about that, right? Kind of, um, I've grown pretty tired of these discussions in EA about like whether climate is an existential risk or not. I think it's kind of a little bit missing the point. And um, yeah, I mean, I think it's like, I think what we've tried to show is, right, you can absolutely engage in climate kind of as an EA and kind of Find, find strategies, et cetera. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, so I would say yes. I think at the same time, um, I don't think it should be like the goal of EA to kind of like tenfold the kind of climate giving of the, of the EA community given like there's not like there's not that much money and there are areas like, I mean, if you look at stuff like nuclear risk, for example, nuclear risk, which is like arguably on the same importance of climate receives like one like one five hundred kind of, of attention, right? So like if I think about like where do I want the next dollar to go or like where should the EA movement kind of grow the, the next dollars, I would probably say like um, the EA movement is roughly speaking right about the fact of like not making climate the, the top priority given how large the attention is, but rather kind of focusing our engagement in climate and kind of improving improving the response. Anything to add? Or? No, that sounds right to me. <laughs> I think that puts us just at about time, but if there's any final thoughts you'd either, either of you would like to share. Um, you know, I just, my, my encouragement um, to anyone who's considering getting into the space is, you know, do your homework. There's just a lot of noise. 
And um, this was the most beneficial impact, I think, of, of uh, frankly, the influence that Founders Pledge has had on other funders. Is you've done, they did a lot of homework, but we have a lot of, I, I'd encourage you to, you know, whether it's us or anyone else, there are other groups around the world that are working on this. We're trying to build these networks. You know, dig in, dig in deep, ask them what they do, how they think. Um, you know, that's, that's actually, it's very rewarding. And if folks are honest, they're happy to have that kind of engagement and have their, their uh, strategies questioned. As, as we were quite <laughs> intensively. Thank you. I think that's a great note to end on. And thanks, everybody, for joining us. Um, Armin and Johannes have office hours directly after this in the room next door. So feel free to continue engaging with them on this. Um, and yeah, let's give them a hand. Thank you.